I was, uh, I, I got to do some fishing up in Alaska a couple of years ago, and I'm out in the middle of the ocean doing some halibut fishing, and I noticed I get a call on my phone, and it was Russ. And Russ said, Dad, uh, I'm sitting here at the Dove Awards, and I've just received uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And he said, and I couldn't help but think about you, so I had to call and tell you, thank you for all you imparted to me over the years. I wouldn't be where I am today if it hadn't been for the impartation. So you never know whose life you are impacting. Amen. 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 You're impacting lives. The Bible says from the writings of the Apostle Paul that every one of us are a living epistle and we're being read, our life story is being read by somebody. So somebody's watching all the time. Amen. Amen. All right, good to be with you tonight. Praise God. Well, I'm, I'm fired up and ready to go. I, I got, after lunch, I got back to the hotel and had a nice little power nap. And uh, we've locked the doors. You're not going anywhere until I'm finished tonight. Okay, praise God. All right, if you have your Bibles with you, let's open them first of all tonight to the book of Luke. And while you're turning there, uh, we'll go first of all to uh, Luke 22. And while you're turning there, uh, Eric mentioned uh, my latest book about the maximum, the highest level achievable. And that's the word the Lord gave me last October, a year ago, that I was to take to the body of Christ everywhere I preached during 2023. And we've, we've been all over Africa this year. We've been all over Europe. Uh, and we've preached all over the world. We've received tremendous testimonies from people in various different nations about how that, that prophetic word has come to pass in their lives. So every year uh, since 1991, I have set aside the first couple of weeks in October to just seek the Lord as to what he would say and what he would show me about the coming new year. Brother Copeland prophesied that over me uh, in 1991, and he said, God is moving you into a new dimension of ministry. It has to do with the office of the seer, and God's going to begin to show you things to come and then hold you responsible for sharing them with the body of Christ, wherever he might send you. So with that in mind, uh, I'd set aside the first couple of weeks in October and just ask the Lord, what, what's the prophetic word that you want me to emphasize going into this new year? And, and what do you want me to see so that I can share it with the body of Christ? And so last October, as I was praying, the Lord said to me, tell the people everywhere you go in 2023 that it's time for the maximum. Yeah. It's time for them to begin to expect and to pursue the highest level attainable. Now, he gave me an example, and, and I won't ask you to turn there, but I'm sure you're familiar with it, from Mark chapter 4 where Jesus taught on the parable of the sower sows the word. And he talked about the different types of soil. And when he got to the good soil, he said the word uh, sown in good soil is capable of producing 30, 60, 100 fold. Now 100 fold represents the highest level attainable. You won't find anywhere in the Bible 200 fold, 300 fold, 400 fold. 100 fold is symbolic of the highest level attainable. Now my question is, if the word of God in your heart is capable of producing a hundred fold results, why settle for 30? Look at your neighbor and say, why are you settling for 30? <laughs> I mean, why not go for the maximum? I mean, if hundred fold is available, then why not go for the maximum? Now it's brought up again in Mark chapter 10, <clears throat> where Jesus was, <clears throat> excuse me, talking to a rich young ruler. And the man asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know the commandments. The man said, yes, I've kept them from my youth. He said, but you lack one thing. He said, sell what you have, give to the poor. And the Bible says the man walked away grieved at that saying because he, he had much possessions. He couldn't, he couldn't give any of them away. So in reality, he didn't have much possessions. His much possessions had him. If you can't give it away, you don't own it. It owns you. 
Thank you for your enthusiasm. <clears throat> so then Jesus turned to his disciples as the man walked away and said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Not impossible, but hard. And the reason being is because rich people many times trust in their riches so they don't think they need God. Now, not all rich people, I know a lot of wealthy people that, that God is first place in their lives. But generally speaking, most rich people uh, have trust in their riches more than they do in the living God. And so that's the reason why the man walked away grieved because he had all these possessions and he wasn't willing to give them up, give any of them up. So Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Now, the disciples spoke up, particularly Peter, James, and John, and they said, well, who then can be saved? Now, that would not be the attitude of a poor man. A poor man would have said, hey, boys, we got it made. Because we don't have anything. No, they said, Jesus, we've left all to follow you. And you have to remember that this happened shortly after the incident with the boat sinking, net breaking load of fish. Okay? Peter, James, and John were in the fishing business with James and John's father, Mr. Zebedee, and they had the best day of fishing in the history of that business the day that Jesus told them, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. And the Bible says they caught so many fish, their boat began to sink, their necks began to break. They beckoned to their partners and they came out and their boats began to sink and their nets began to break. The best day in the fishing business, in the history of that business they'd ever had. And the next day they walk away from it. That's the reason they said, well, who then can be saved? These were rich fishermen. Okay, you don't think they ate all those fish, do you? <laughs> no, they took them to the market, sold them. Best day they'd ever had. And Jesus said, follow me. And they walked away from it all to follow Jesus. And that's the reason they said they were shocked. Well, who then can be saved? We just gave everything to follow you. And you say it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God? And then he made this statement. Anyone who leaves father, brethren, lands, possessions, for my sake or the gospel shall receive in this time. Everybody say in this time. In this time. A hundredfold. A hundredfold. A hundredfold. Yes. Amen. That represents maximum. Okay, now I, I preached on the hundredfold. I, I learned it. I'm, this is my 54th year in the ministry. I learned it the first three months I was saved in, in 1969. I heard Kenneth Copeland preach a message on the hundredfold. And at that time, uh, I had been a young businessman, owned automotive business, and I shut my business down to go into to practice, to prepare for full-time ministry. And I still had a lot of business debts that I was believing to pay off. I had a lot of personal debts that I was believing to pay off. And when Brother Copeland preached about the hundredfold, I grabbed hold of it because... 30-fold wouldn't do me any good. I mean, if I, if I gave an offering and I got a 30-fold return on it, I'm still deep in debt. 60-fold, it helped, but it wouldn't help much. I needed 100-fold. I like to say I was forced, my wife and I were forced to believe for 100-fold. And God honored it. And we've experienced 100-fold many, many times. And, of course, over the years, I've been challenged with, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. One, one person said, when Jesus said in Mark 10, you shall receive a hundredfold, that was just a metaphor. A metaphor. I said, sir, would you tell me, this is a preacher challenging me. I said, would you tell me what a field full of metaphor looks like? <laughs> he said, I don't understand. I said, obviously. I said, have you ever read Genesis chapter 26? No. I said, well, read it right now. Read it. And I said, the Bible says there was a famine in the land and God spoke to Isaac and said, don't go to Egypt. Stay right here. I'll be with you. I will bless you. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Amen. 
Now, sir, tell me what a field full of metaphor looks like. He said, I still don't understand. I said, obviously. Keep reading. The Bible says, when the Philistines saw the hundredfold on the sowing of his seed, they envied him. How can you envy metaphor? It had to be real crops growing right in front of their eyes. In fact, you could tell their land and you could tell Isaac's land. Yes. Their land was scorched. His was plentiful in crops. Yes. And the Bible says, and the man waxed great. Yes. Now, that's not a Texas term. We don't wax great in Texas. I've never had anybody say, uh, or I've never had anybody in Texas, how you doing? Waxing great, thank you. <laughs> no. And I don't think it's a Pittsburgh, you know, yeah. area saying it all. So what it really means is increasing. He increased by the day, one translation said. One translation even says he got richer by the day. He waxed great and he grew and he became very great. So notice the hundredfold is not a metaphor. It, it, it's a real possibility. But most Christians settle for less because they don't think God's capable of producing hundredfold. Now, we just got through singing a song about all things are possible, everything's possible with God. Are we just singing or do we really believe it? Half the songs the church sings, they don't believe, they just sing them out of routine. If you don't respond better, I'm going someplace else to preach, okay? <laughs> No, we sing a lot of songs that are full of the word and we just sing them. And then sometimes we talk of, you know, way maker, you know, when I don't see it, he's working. When I can't feel it, he's working and walk right out the door and say, I don't feel, I don't feel like God's doing anything. You just got through singing for 30 minutes. He's a way maker. Amen. So. Why settle for less if God says potentially hundredfold? That's good. Now, a number of years ago, I'm giving you plenty of time to find Luke 22, okay? <laughs> a number of years ago, uh, my daughter Terry, which some of you know, I believe she's been here, has she? Yeah. And uh, Terry was CEO of our ministry before she launched out into her own ministry. And uh, she said, Dad, there's, there's a man that's been contacting the ministry and he knows you and he's, he's very familiar with the ministry and he's a, 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 a motivational speaker and speaks in Fortune 500 companies quite often and he has called us several times and said, ask your dad if he'd like for me to come and speak to his staff and she said, uh, he's going to be in the Fort Worth area. Do you mind if we uh, ask him to come speak to the staff this week? I said, no, I'd love to have him. So uh, we had gathered up all the staff and had some other people come as well, other ministry staffs. And uh, so when we turned the meeting over to him, he, the first thing he came out of his mouth, he said this, how many of you believe dogs love bones? Well, every member on my staff lifted their hand, including me. I lifted my hand. In fact, I just gave my dog a bone that morning that I had brought back from a restaurant that I didn't eat all the meat off of, you know, and, and, he, and, and I brought it for him. And I just gave it to him that morning before I went to the office. So I had my hand up like everybody else. He said, next. Next thing came out of his mouth. Dogs don't love bones. They love steak. They settle for bones. I put my hand down real quick. <laughs> I thought, that'll preach, praise God. <laughs> Amen. Dogs don't love bones. They love steak. If you don't believe it, go home, make up a nice steak, put it out there next to a bone and see which one he takes. <laughs> now that is an example of the body of Christ. The body of Christ has been settling for bones when God's been offering steak. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So that's basically what I have taken to the world ever since last October and, and have been preaching about go for the maximum. Go for the highest level attainable. Why settle for anything less when God says you're going to have his best? Now, I'm the kind of person, see, I didn't, I didn't come, I didn't have a religious background, so to speak. Uh, I grew up in a little, uh, I'm a country boy. I was born in, 
in the, in the sticks of Mississippi. And when you're born in Mississippi, it's two syllables, Mississippi, Amen. not Mississippi, you know. <laughs> so I was born in the sticks. I mean, we, we, uh, we had a dirt road to our house. My grandfather bought that farm in 1927. It's where my dad grew up. It's where I was born. And, and they, it was very rural, very primitive. Uh, my grandfather worked hard to maintain that farm uh, during the Depression. My dad was a young boy during the Depression. And, and uh, uh, during the Depression, my grandfather developed, because it was hard, and he used to tell me stories about it, he developed a poverty mentality. In fact, he never trusted another bank the rest of his life. He buried his money on the farm. When I found that out, I became a treasure hunter. <laughs> I found money buried all over the farm. I mean, he had it in some of the most unusual places. And after my grandparents died and after my parents died, I inherited the farm and I, I never got back over there. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with this place? So I went over there uh, to pray about what I wanted to do with it. But I made sure I'd found all the money on the farm before I put it up for sale, okay? Because <laughs> I knew I hadn't found it all. And sure enough, there was money I found buried in different places. It was in the hay loft. It, it was everywhere. And, uh, and, and I'm not talking about a, a lot of money, but Grandpa became a miser, okay? And uh, he, he just wouldn't, he, I mean, he would not let go of a dollar if he could find another way, you know? So anyway, uh, eventually, uh, by the time I was, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years old, we finally, Grandpa finally built a shotgun house. You know what a shotgun house is? You can stand at the front, look all the way through it to the back. Just a long, narrow house. Looked like a chicken coop, you know? <laughs> and, and, and we had outdoor plumbing. Didn't have indoor plumbing. We had a, a well, a deep well. We had a bucket with a rope on it, threw it down in the well and cranked it up. And then one day we got sophisticated. We got a pump. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we could pump that water out of there. But you, you got you to prime the pump, though. Grandpa said, don't, don't ever use this cup of water. I always leave a cup of water to prime the pump, you know. But anyway, I was born in a rural location. I'm a country boy. I like my space. I still like my space. I'm still a country boy. And, and uh, uh, it, it was, uh, I grew up in a little small wood frame Baptist church down at the end of our road. In fact, my, my grandfather went to Calvary Baptist Church, but my grandmother didn't like it. She said, it, it's too stiff. And she said, and there was a, a, a black church just down the road from us walking distance. And the first church I went to was the Calvary Baptist, and Grandma said, son, go with me next Sunday. That's where your grandpa goes. I don't go there. It's too stiff. I go to the black church. They're more lively. <laughs> so we went to the black church, me and Grandma, and she was right. They were lively, man. We, we had church, you know. And so I, I, I grew up in that kind of environment, but I knew nothing about the Bible. I mean, I'd read the stories, childhood stories, David and Goliath, Samson and Delilah, you know, and those kind of things. But I had no idea you could actually live by the word of God. That, was, that, that came as a great revelation to me. I thought it was just a history book about people that lived a long time ago. You know, it didn't have anything to do with us today until Kenneth Copeland came in 1969 and preached the message of faith that changed my life. And, 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 and then when I shut my business down and began to prepare for full-time ministry, Everything I read was revelation, and I was shocked. I, I thought the Bible was nothing more than thou shalt nots. I thought everything I like, God was against. Anybody ever felt that way? You, know, you grow up in church, believe in that kind of thing? You know, that little Baptist church? I never heard the pastor say, now he might have because I didn't pay good attention he may have, but I don't think he did. I never heard a sermon about Abraham's blessings are ours. I never heard a sermon about we're redeemed from the curse. All I ever heard the pastor say was, there's none righteous, no, not one. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We're all sinners saved by grace. 
Same sermon every week. And then when I got into the word of God, I was shocked at all the thou shalt do's, thou shalt have's, thou shalt be's. I was shocked. And so one day, I'm, I'm about two months old in the Lord, I took my Bible and I held it up. I said, God, if there's anything in this book that you didn't really mean, tell me now so I don't waste my time believing for it. That was 54 years ago, and he's never said, uh, by the way, I didn't really mean that. He meant every word of it, yes. and if he meant every word of it, right. then I'm going for it. Yes. I'm going for it, praise God. Does anybody else have that attitude? Amen. If he didn't mean it, he shouldn't have put it in my copy of the book, because once I find it, I'm going for it. And, and I, may be, I may be small in stature, but I got a bulldog tenacity. I don't give up. I just hang on until it manifests, praise God. And that's the way I've lived for 54 years now, and God has honored it, hallelujah. So I, I, I came into this having the attitude, I want God's best. Because when you're experiencing God's best, God uses your life as an attraction. People see. I've had many people that I've won to the Lord that I never preached one word to. They just came up to me and said, where are you getting all this? How are you doing this? And I just say, it's the God I serve. Amen. It's his blessing on my life. It's his favor on my life. Would you like to know my God? And I've never had anybody turn me down who asked me that question. Right. You know, God wants us to experience his best yes. and particularly in these last days Amen. because there's still multitudes of people that need to come to Christ yes. and I yes. believe we're the generation yes. that's going to usher him in, yes. praise God. And God's going to use, God's going to use as a major evangelistic tool your life. Yes. They're going to see what God's doing in and with and for you and they're going to want to know how are you doing this. And that's your opportunity to say, it's the God I serve. Amen. He's a good God. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody shout, he's a good God. He's a good God. And give him a good shout of praise. Amen. Amen. So that's, that's basically in a nutshell what I've been preaching all over the world since October of 2022. Now, it's October again. And I've heard the word of the Lord for 2024. And I want to share some of it with you tonight. Now, here's the first thing he said to me. He said, emphasize strongly. And I, I'm endeavoring to do that as strongly as I possibly can. He said, emphasize to the people that in 2024, it is a must that they keep a grip on their faith that they stay focused on what I've said in my word. And if they will do that, then I will cause them to experience progression, advancement, and their highest expectations will be fulfilled. Amen. But he emphasized strongly, tell them, stay in faith, stay focused, and don't let anything that's happening in the world distract you. And we're living in a world today that is different from the world we lived in just three years ago. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. There are more distractions today than there's ever been. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I never would have thought when I came to the Lord 54 years ago that the world I live in would be the world that I live in today. It's, it's not the same. It's changing by the moment. Yes. And there are more distractions and they are designed by Satan to rob you of God's promises. Yes. And you'd be surprised at the number of Christians who are easily distracted. Yes. Amen. Amen. Easily distracted. Yeah, that's right. and, and distractions have a way of stifling your faith. That's good. Choke your faith. That's good. And you know as well as I do, the Bible says that it's impossible to please God without faith. And faith is our method of victory over the world. That's right. Not only that, the Bible says, and it is a commandment and not a suggestion, the just shall live by faith. Yes. One translation says, the just shall have their lives sustained by their faith. 
Amen. So if you let go of your faith, then it's not likely you're going to have your life sustained through all the chaos that's happening in the world today. So it's important that we never, never, never let go of our faith. Amen. You need to hear the word of faith more today than you've ever heard it in your life. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your amens. Amen. amen. In fact, I have, a, I have a, an assignment. This is your homework. Go back and dust off those old cassette tapes that you heard the message of faith for the first time. Now, some of you don't even know what a cassette tape is. I go as far back as reel-to-reel tapes. That's where we started, you know. Yeah, reel-to-reel tapes, then cassette, then uh, uh, CDs, you know, or what was that, A-track, CD. I've been through every movement, you know. So anyway, uh, go back and dig out of your closet in that box and get those old messages by Kenneth Hagin, Oral Roberts, John Osteen, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Jerry Savelle, <laughs> where you heard the message of faith for the very first time and allow it to do again on the inside of you what it did the first time you heard it. Amen. How many of you remember the very first time you heard the word of faith? Yeah. Did, it, did it cause a reaction on the inside yeah. of you? I mean, it, 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 it wasn't just a reaction with me. It was an explosion. Yeah. I thought, yeah. dear God, where's this been all my life? And why, is some, why hadn't somebody told me sooner? If I'd, if I'd have known God was as good as he's been to me all these years, when the doctor delivered me and spatted me on the bottom, if I'd have known it was going to be this good, I would have shouted right there, Jesus is Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> but I didn't know that until much later, okay? But my life has been... Uh, Exciting, to say the least, because of what I learned about the promises of God and how that it is his desire to fulfill each and every one of them. So my suggestion is go back and dig up that material that first inspired you and let it do it again. You say, well, that, that, that first heard those messages back in the 70s or 80s you mean they'll still inspire me? Well, this book was written a long, long time ago. Does it still inspire you? Yes. And it's older than cassettes you got. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So if it will help you to develop a stronger faith, because you're going to need it the rest of your life. This world's not getting easier to live in. You're going to need your faith more now than you've ever needed it in your life. In fact, if, if you don't know how to live by faith, uh, you, you, you better learn how quick. You better learn how quick. Amen? Because faith is still the method of victory over, that overcomes the world. Now, go to Luke chapter 22. I've given you plenty of time to find it. Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> and uh, let's look at verse 31. Jesus is talking to Simon <clears throat> and he makes this statement in verse 31. Everybody find it? And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat. Uh, he said, uh, he has desired to have you and to sift you as wheat. Now, the word sift means to extract something from you. He's trying to take something from you, Simon. And remember, Simon was there when Jesus taught on the parable, the sower sows the word. And notice what Jesus said, once the word is sown. And remember what Paul said about the word, <clears throat> Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Yeah. So Simon heard Jesus say, once the word is sown, Satan cometh immediately to steal the word. In reality, Satan doesn't care anything about you. He doesn't care anything about me. It's the word of God in you 
that makes you a threat to him. In fact, he don't care if you die tonight and go to heaven. He don't care if you die tonight and go to hell. What he cares about is when you're still alive on the earth and have the word of God in your heart. That's what he's after because you're dangerous to him with the word in your heart when you're still on the earth. So once the word is sown, Satan comes immediately to steal the word. Why is he after the word? Because the word produces faith. So you can take it a step further. He's coming immediately to steal the word so that he can steal your faith. Now notice Jesus said, He's trying to, he wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to extract something from you that makes you dangerous to him. But then he went on to say, but I prayed for you. I prayed for thee. Okay? That your faith fail not. So it is obvious from the next verse that what Jesus is endeavoring to to get Simon to understand, Simon, what he's really after is your faith the faith that the word in you has produced. Why? Because with faith, you can can overcome anything he throws your way. So he's after your faith. But I prayed for you that your faith fail not, the King James says. Now, the first time I read that scripture, I thought it was a misprint. Now, my wife's been filled with the Holy Ghost since she's eight years old. And she's been in this a lot longer than me. And back when I first came into this, as far as I was concerned, Carolyn and the Holy Ghost were one and the same because she had to explain everything to me, okay? So I went to Carolyn. I said, Carolyn, I found a misprint in the Bible. She said, there's no misprints in the Bible. I said, yes, there is. I found one. She said, what are you talking about? I said, everything we have ever learned about faith produces results. Faith overcomes the world. Faith moves mountains. Faith can do this. Faith can do that. Here, Jesus prayed that Simon's faith wouldn't fail. I'd never heard that faith had the potential of failing. Have you? He said, I prayed that your faith fail not. And I thought, this this is troubling me. You mean, I'm spending all this time in the word developing my faith and there's a possibility it might fail? Well, where did I turn then if faith won't work? So I, I started looking for other translations and there was various things. But when I found it in the Greek, it changed everything. Here's what it says in the Greek. I have prayed that your faith, King James, fail not in the little Greek. It means reduced to inactivity. I pray that your faith will not be reduced to inactivity. Why? Because inactive faith is faith that's not producing anything. Amen? Faith that's not producing anything. So he's saying, Simon, Satan is after you. He wants your faith. But I'm praying that your faith will not be reduced to inactivity. As long as it's active, then it's productive. Can you say amen? amen? As long as your faith is active, then it's capable of producing. Faith doesn't fail as such as, you know, not working. But it can be reduced to inactivity and you're the one who allows that to happen. Amen. Amen. And and what would cause someone's faith to be reduced to inactivity? CNN? (laughs) Too much time watching worldly news? That would cause your faith to become inactive. People get upset with me. They try, to, they try to push CNN on me. Did you hear what CNN? No, I didn't. You mean you didn't hear what CNN said last night? No, I didn't. Why? Because faith doesn't come by watching CNN. Faith cometh by hearing the word. Amen. Now something does come by watching CNN all the time. Fear, worry, distress, discouragement. And your faith will be reduced in activity if you, if, you, if you don't correct it soon. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm not telling you not to watch the news at all. I'm not telling you not to watch television at all. In fact, if I happen to have the television on and the news is on and they're saying this is going to happen, that's going to happen, I just stand, I talk back to those people. <laughs> I say, lady, 
That may be the way it's going to be in your house, but not in my house. And so I turn the channel. Go to the sports, ESPN. Something important. See how the Steelers are doing, you know. And of course, next week I'll be finding out how the Packers are doing, you know. And next week I'll be finding out how the 49ers are doing because I'm in all those cities. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm not telling you don't ever watch television. I'm just saying be selective about what you allow your eyes to see and your ears to hear because your eyes and your ears are the gateways to your heart. Yeah. And what gets in your heart is going to come out of your mouth, yeah. out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And if you go to talking, woe is me all the time yes. because of what you're hearing and what you're seeing, you're in trouble. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. So you have to protect your heart, the Bible says in Proverbs 4. Protect your heart by what you watch and what you hear. So notice here, uh, Jesus' prayer for Simon Peter was that his faith would never be reduced in activity. And I, I'm saying to you, that's my prayer for you tonight, yeah. that your faith will not be reduced yeah. be to inactivity and the, and the only way that it would happen is if you begin to allow other things to become more important in your life than this book. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you came. This message is for you. <laughs> no, don't tell them that. They might get offended. Okay, <laughs> anyway, so the importance of this is, is to stay in faith. Yeah. Stay focused and don't allow the things around you to distract you. Now, uh, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' uh, disciples came to him one day and said, Master, tell us about the end, the end of the world. And one of the first things he said in verse 4 was, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. That says to me that a Apparently, Jesus is implying that in the last days, deception will be running rampant. Amen? Deception. What, what is deception? It is Satan's attempt to get you to believe something that the Word of God didn't say. Amen? Deception. That's, that's I, I like to say it this way. That is Satan's greatest weapon. If he can't deceive you, he can't beat you. That's right. Did you notice the Bible talks about that during that millennial reign and everything and, and uh, Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire, the pit, and there will be no deception? See, when he's removed, the, the, the deception is removed. Well, you can remove him in your personal life as well. And when you remove his influence in your life, deception is removed at the same time. Because that's his, that's his mightiest weapon. If he can deceive you, if he can get you to fall for lies, well, God's not interested in taking care of you. God, God, there's not that much money in the world. And if there was, God wouldn't get it to you. If he can get you to believe a lie and deceive you, then he's endeavoring to try to get you to reduce your faith in activity. Amen? Amen? So if you begin to think, well, this is impossible, and even God can't do this. Even God can't turn this around. Yes, he can. Amen? Amen. He's El Shaddai, the God in whom nothing is impossible. That's right. Amen. Amen? But Satan will do his best to try to deceive you into thinking, you've got a problem now that's bigger than what God can handle. It doesn't get bigger than God can handle. He does exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I love the Amplified Version. It says, what do we dare think? What do we dare ask? You know, I'm, I'm from the South, and we have in the South what we call a double dog dare. You have double dog dares up here? Well, when I was, when I was growing up, and you were given a double dog dare, you didn't turn it down or you weren't worth your salt. And I was a dare 
devil. <laughs> Whatever they dared me to do, I did it. And especially if it was a double dog dare. I don't know where we got that, but I know it's serious. It's double dog. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I, I, I was an athlete growing up. I played baseball all my young life, and I was involved in gymnastics and, and uh, uh, track and field, and, and I loved sports. But my best sport was baseball. I played all the way up to a, a farm league team sponsored by the Kansas City Royals. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I, when in college, I was a lifeguard. At, we, our college was on a river, a, a, a big river there run through uh, Louisiana. So if one of my best friends, he and I were lifeguards. And we'd be on that river, and there was a bridge that went across the river. And it was a high bridge. And... and uh, I'm sitting there one day and some guy says, Savelle, a double dog dare you to jump off that bridge. I said, hold my jacket, you know. <laughs> I went over there and climbed up on that bridge, dove off of it. And of course, if you do it, then you have the right to come back and double dog dare the man who double dog dared you, but you add something to it that he didn't make you do. I said, I dare you to do a uh, a, a flip off of that bridge. He went up there and jumped, did a flip off of it. Come back, double dog dared me to do a back flip off of it. I did a double, I did a back flip off of it. I double dog dared him to do a double trip, a flip off of it. And then he double dog dared me to get on top of the railing above the bridge, you know, the structure above the bridge, and dive off. And I had to climb up on the railing and dive off. And man, it was high, dear Lord. I thought, I believe I'll pass up this double dog there. But I didn't. And uh, really, there wasn't anything else we could do, so we had to find another bridge to do, <laughs> do you know, something. I dove off a bridge one time, and the shore patrol was down there waiting on me, at, and I didn't know they were there until I was diving off, and I saw them over the boat. And they came over to me and said, son, now, to appreciate this story, you have to understand, I haven't always been the big hunk of a man that I am today. I used to be little, okay? Uh, and I, I weighed about 95 pounds, and I jumped off this bridge. And the shore patrol came up when I got up. He said, son, did you check under the bridge before you dove off? I said, well, I've been here before. He said, so you know there's nothing under there that you could injure yourself. I said, well, I... A long time ago, I was here, and I didn't feel anything down there. He said, well, I just want you to know, earlier today, they caught a catfish out of here that weighed more than you. It was 105 pounds. He would have swallowed you, boy. <laughs> I quit jumping off that bridge. Anyway, <laughs> so I was that way. So my point is, I hear God because his throne is in southern heaven. He's a southern God. <laughs> You do believe that, don't you? Amen. No. So I hear God from the Amplified Version saying, I double dog dare you to think big. I double dog dare you to believe big. I double dog dare you to imagine big. As big as you can think it, believe it, pray it, I'm bigger than that. Yes. Amen. amen. Say, say amen if you believe it, praise God. <clears throat> so notice... Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. So one of the things that's most important in these last days is don't fall for deception because it will stifle your faith. It'll cause your faith to be reduced in activity. And if your faith is reduced in activity, then you're not getting any results. And obviously, you and I need results amen. in these last days. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I want you to... Uh, uh, go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now we're talking about progression, advancement, and our highest expectations being fulfilled in 2024. And by the way, you don't have to wait till 2024. You can start now, praise God. Yeah. Because I do this every year. When Once the Lord gives me that prophetic word, the first thing I do before I preach it anywhere, I say, Lord, if you don't mind, I would appreciate it 
if you would confirm this word with signs following in my life now, so when I take it to the rest of the world, it will give validity to the message. And he does it every year. I'm already experiencing progression, advancement, and some of my highest expectations have already been fulfilled. Amen. Amen. So that's, that's the message I'm endeavoring to share with you tonight, that God wants you to progress Amen. and to advance Amen. in this coming new year and your highest expectations being fulfilled. So what is required? Stay in faith. Stay focused. Don't allow distractions to cause your faith to become inactive. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, notice the Apostle Paul says, holding faith or hold on to faith. The uh, uh, message translation uh, talks about uh, holding on to your faith and, and uh, if getting a firm grip on your faith, the way it says it. Hey, get a firm grip on your faith. And he says, and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith. Notice some have put away concerning faith. And here's the end result. They've made shipwreck of their lives. He says, so you must have a firm grip on your faith. Some have not kept a firm grip on their faith. And today their lives are shipwreck. Now I know a lot of people like that. I know a lot of preachers like that who started out, you know, same time I did way back there a long time ago, preaching powerful messages on faith and, and for some reason or another because they got distracted with another message that sounded good but was not quite accurate, you know, was the popular thing in the body of Christ. T.L. Osmond told me years ago, long time ago, he said, Jerry, I've been in this long enough and I've watched all this go in cycles. About every 20 years, they start preaching the same thing. They just give it a new title. And it's all designed to cause people to become inactive with their faith. And uh, so notice here he says, those who have let go of their faith, they end up shipwrecked. The message translation says, they make a thorough mess of their lives. And I know Christians like that. I know preachers like that. You don't have to be one of them. Right. Look, you never tell them you don't have to be one of them. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And how can you avoid making a mess of your life? Keep a firm grip on your faith. Yes. Keep a firm grip on your faith. Yes. You ought to be. You ought to thank God if you're a member of this church. You ought to thank God that you have a place where you can be fed every week the word of faith, so your faith can grow and keep you on target with what, what God wants to do in your life. Amen. 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 You know, we, we go to places all over the world and a lot of places, they don't even have one word of faith church in their area. I remember back in the day when, when Carol and I would drive 100, 200 miles just to hear somebody preach the word of faith. We, we, Kenneth Copeland came to our hometown and that's the first time I heard the word of faith. And, and he came back a second time about six months later. And this time he, he talked about Kenneth Hagin quite often about things he'd learned from Kenneth Hagin. Well, I'd never heard of Kenneth Hagin. I wouldn't have known him if he stands side to him, next to me. You know, I didn't know what he looked like, didn't never heard him. But Brother Copeland mentioned him so frequently. So I told Carol, I said, if Kenneth Hagin ever comes to our area, we're going to go hear him. If, if Brother Copeland learned most of what he learned about faith from Kenneth Hagin, we need to hear him. <clears throat> and so one day we got a, a little card in the mail. And I still do not know to this day how we got that card because we certainly were not on Kenneth Hagin's mailing list. We never met the man, never been in a meeting, only heard his name. And uh, we got this little card that, Kenneth Hagin's going to be in Tyler, Texas for one night. I said, Carolyn, we're going. Now, Tyler was about 100 miles from our house. And we got in the car and we drove to Tyler, Texas. And all the way over there, we confessed, we're going to have a front row seat. I wanted to be just as close to Kenneth Hagin as I could be. Because Brother Copeland talked so much about what he'd learned from him. And so all the way over there, 
We said, we're believing in the name of Jesus for a front row seat. And we took one lady with us that wanted to go. And, and when we got to this little hotel downtown Tyler, Texas, it held about 100 people in the ballroom. When we walked up to the door, a man met us at the door and said, uh, I'm sorry, uh, there are no more seats in the house. We had 100 chairs. They're all taken. There's no more seats in the house. And I looked at Carol and I said, and I'd learned this from Brother Copeland. I'm not moved by what I hear. I thought, this is a good time to say that, praise God. I said, yeah, it felt good. I'm not moved by what I hear. He said, no, you don't understand, sir. We don't have any more chairs. There's, there's no place to put another chair. I'm still not moved by what I hear. I believe I got a front row seat. He looked at me like I'd lost my mind. I'm telling you, you can ask my wife if she was here. It wasn't 15 seconds. And a man came and, and told that man, we just found three more chairs in a closet, but the only place we can put them is in the front of the front row. <laughs> I wanted to go, nah, 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 but I did, and I was nice, you know. <laughs> and we sat in front of the front row. I could reach out and touch Kenneth Hagin. I was so close to him. And man, when we left that service that night, as I say, I was higher than a Georgia pine tree on faith. I didn't even need a car to get home 100 miles. I, I, I was, I was, I, my faith was high. And, and by the next day, we were having miracles. Just based on what we'd heard that night, it inspired our faith so much. Well, I never dreamed back then that I'd become friends with Kenneth Hagin and would preach with Kenneth Hagin. And, and many times when I was preaching with him, he, he knew how much I loved him, how much I respected him, and how much I listened to his messages. In fact, uh, Joe reached down in that, in my bag right here. And uh, let me show you this. It won't take but a minute here. Or let me, let me get it. I know exactly where it is. This is one of the first iPods that came out. Okay, I, I keep it in this little bag. One of the first iPods. I don't even remember what year it came out. But I, I'm not, I'm not computer savvy, you know. But I know how to believe God to pay people that are. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I thought, what do I need to learn this? I got people that already know how. I'll just keep studying the Word and preaching the Word, and they can do it, you know. Yeah. So I took all of my reel-to-reel -reel tapes, all of my cassette tapes of Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, John Osteen, some of the earliest messages that I heard from 1969 to about 1972, and I took them over to my office in a big box, and I said, I want all that downloaded on this little thing by Friday. By Friday, Brother Jerry, yes, I'm going to Africa, and I got 21 hours of flying time, and this is what I want to listen to all the way. Amen. I got 2,000 sermons on this little thing. <laughs> I can preach every one of them word for word. And Brother Hagin knew that, and every once in a while when I was preaching with him, he'd, he'd come up and tap me on the shoulder, take over, Brother Jerry. <laughs> and I knew exactly where he was going, and I'd preach it just as best as I could like he did. In fact, I preached Kenneth Hagin's sermon so much, I felt like I was born in McKinney, Texas, <laughs> where he was born. Amen. Now, that, that goes with me everywhere I go. Why? Well, Brother Jerry, 54 years, and you're still studying the Bible like that? Yes. Why? It didn't say faith came by having heard. It said faith cometh by hearing and hearing. Amen. Hearing and hearing. Yes. And I need, I need strong faith in these last days, yes. stronger than my faith has ever been before. Yes. And that's the reason I practice what I preach, okay? Yes. I'm not just suggesting you do it, I do it. <clears throat> so notice <clears throat> the, the instructions Paul is giving Timothy, which was his son in the Lord, was keep a firm grip on your faith. Keep a firm grip on your faith because if you let it go like some others have, then you're going to make a thorough mess of your life. And that is not what God wants and that's certainly not the way he wants you to end up. 
Amen? Amen. I, I'd hate to think that I have spent the last 54 years of my life preaching around the world. I've traveled on the average of 20 days out of every month preaching all over the world, and I've done that for 54 years. I, I would hate to think that I've invested all of this for 54 years and then right at the end decide, well, maybe CNN's right. Maybe the Republicans are right. Maybe the Democrats are right. Maybe this is what's going to happen. Maybe I don't have a chance and make a thorough mess of my life after 54 years of developing a faith that's produced a beautiful life. I'm not going to do that. I like to say it this way. My mama didn't raise no food. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to stick with what got me here. Because yes. it's going to take me where I'm going. Yes. Give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Now, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, remember, we got 1 Timothy, we got 2 Timothy. This book, these two letters are filled with instructions, mostly for young ministers, but not exclusively. There's certainly uh, principles that apply to everybody in this room, whether you're in five-fold ministry or not. And notice how he says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse uh, 15, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Now notice, what is he talking about? Give yourself holy to these things. Meditate upon these things. What's he talking about? These instructions, these, these principles. And the most important principle I feel that Paul gave Timothy was the one we just read in verse 19. Holding faith. Have a firm grip on your faith. Because if you let go of it, you're going to make a thorough mess of your life. So notice he says, meditate on this, Timothy. Think about it. Have it on your mind all the time. And then give yourself wholly to it. In other words, devote yourself to it. Commit yourself to it. In other words, what I hear him say is, Timothy... Don't ever let go of your faith. Meditate on why that's important. Not only that, but commit yourself to it. Don't just let it be something you hear one night in a meeting like this and then forget about it by morning. Commit yourself to it. I, I hope that everyone in here tonight and everybody watching by way of live stream will commit themselves to what they're hearing tonight that you'll walk away saying, in the name of Jesus, I refuse to allow myself to be deceived. I refuse to, to loosen my grip on my faith. I refuse to lose my focus on the word of God. And I refuse to be distracted by what's happening in the world around me. I'm committed to this principle. I'm devoted to this. Now, that's what Jesus told me to tell you. And if you do that, then he said, and tell them. If they'll do it, then their 2024 will be a year of progress, a year of advancement, a year of which their highest expectations will be fulfilled. That sounds good to me. How about you? Lift both hands and say, I commit. I give myself holy to these instructions that I'm hearing tonight. I'm not playing church about it. I'm serious about it. I will protect my heart. I'll be selective about what I see and what I hear because in Jesus' name, I want God's best. I want to progress. I want to advance and I want my highest expectation to be fulfilled. I believe it, I mix my faith with it, and I shall have it and give the Lord a shout in advance. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, 
that's the gist of what the Lord has instructed me to share with you tonight. Uh, don't ever accuse me of getting through. I just have to quit somewhere. <laughs> that's just, uh, I began teaching this at our church two weeks ago, and I always spend at least three weeks, three weeks with my church emphasizing this before I take it to the rest of the world. You're an exception. Because <laughs> usually I don't take it to the rest of the world until I've already preached at least three weeks in my own church. But I just sense the leading of the Lord tonight uh, to share with you. Because I know, I know that you guys are believing to progress and to advance with this new land and buildings and so forth. And that's what it's going to take to fulfill that high expectation. This is not the time to let go of your faith. Not the time to be running around and seeing what's tickling the ears of the rest of the body of Christ. Stay focused. Amen. Stay focused. Don't be distracted. And I believe by the end of 2024, you're going to look back and say, my, 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 look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's give him another shout of praise. Yeah. Amen. Stand with me if you will, please. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Just lift your hands and just pray in the spirit for a few moments. Just pray in the spirit. Honor the presence of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We honor you. We honor your presence. We thank you that you're the God that makes things happen. You make impossible things happen. And we bless you for it. In the name of Jesus. Now, let me say this. <clears throat> Regressing is never the will of God. That's the opposite of progressing. It's never God's will that we go backwards. It's always God's will that we go forward. And when the children reached the, the Red Sea and they thought Moses had brought them out there to just die, they, they, they don't know that God can split a Red Sea. They can't read Exodus. They're doing Exodus. We can read Exodus and then we know that God is capable of splitting seas. But they didn't know that. And they get to that Red Sea and they think it's all over. Moses just brought us out here to die. Yeah, I'd, I, I wouldn't have wanted to be Moses. How would you like to pastor a church that three million people hate you? The whole congregation hates you. They want to stone you. I think the happiest day in Moses' life was the day he died. He didn't have to pastor that group anymore. <laughs> I think that's reading God hit his body too. <laughs> but now they're at the Red Sea. And they're inquiring, what do we do now, Moses? You brought us out here to die. What do we do now? So God, uh, Moses... Ask the Lord, what do we do? And, and the way it's worded, it almost sounds like God is surprised that Moses would have to ask him what to do. And God said, tell the people, go forward. What else can you do but go forward? See, behind them, Pharaoh had gathered his army up again. He has decided he's either going to bring them back into captivity or he's going to kill them where they stand but they're not going to leave Egypt. And they can, they can see the dust from the chariots to the rear. And God says to Moses, tell the people, go forward. Yes. And so he does what God tells him to do. The sea splits and they go over on dry ground. Now they're one happy group. Moses has come through again for a moment. Then they finally get on the other side, dry ground. They watch Pharaoh's armies come through that pathway. God closes up the sea, swallows them all up. Now God's people are on the other side. 
They're shouting. They're rejoicing. They're singing songs of victory. The horse and the rider's been thrown into the sea. All that singing makes you thirsty and there's no water. Moses, you brought us out here to die. So what does God do? He gets water out of a rock. Oh, they're happy again. Shaking their tamarines. Oh, hallelujah. Our God is a great God. Our God is good. Oh, victory. Victory in Jesus. Not Jesus, in God. <laughs> he hadn't come yet. But all that praise makes you hungry and they don't have anything to eat. Moses, you brought us out here to die. This is one of the most fickle groups of people you've ever heard about. So what's God do? Gives them manna from heaven. They eat manna from heaven. They're full. They've drank plenty of water. They're happy again. Every time they had another challenge, he brought us out here to die. He brought us out here to die. But God's instructions every time was keep going forward. Everything I have for you is ahead, not behind you. Everything God has for you and me is just ahead of us. As reading the Apostle Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Everything God has for you and everything you want is just ahead of you, not behind you. Somebody said, oh, back in those good old days. No, those may have been good days, but they weren't your best days. Your best days are just ahead of you. Amen. Amen. So how are you ever going to how are you ever going to tap into what Paul refers to, and he's quoting Isaiah, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things, the things that God had prepared. Those things are ahead. Yes. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. Yes. Amen. So that means there's so much more that we haven't tapped into yet that is just ahead. And what is God's plan for us in 2024? Progression, advancement, highest expectations fulfilled. Folks, the rest of the world may be having their worst of times, but if you stay in faith and you stay focused and you not allow yourself to get distracted, you're going to have your absolute best of times. Give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah.